from early on, I was with a brother whom I dearly love, that I was smarter than and more ambitious than. And I couldn't see, you know, I, I couldn't see that he was any better than I was. So when I started flying, um, and a bunch of boys were already there doing it, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't. What um, first piqued your interest in, in flying? Like, when was, did you have a first flight, or what? Yes. How did you learn about that? Um, I was hired as a model to go up on Mount McKinley, Alaska, for a five-day photographic shoot for next year's catalog of clothing. How old were you? I was 23. And I had already been through college, you know, studied in journalism, um, and hadn't really, I was ski bumming. <laughs> I hadn't found anything I really wanted to do, except write, but it didn't make enough money. And so I was ski bumming, the owner of the ski clothing company saw me skiing, asked me to try on clothes. They sent me to Alaska. And in the process of getting up onto 10,000 feet up the side of Mount McKinley, um, I met Alaska's premier bush pilot, who was Don Sheldon. And he pretty much had a monopoly on, on supplying and taking uh, climbers or anybody else who was going on, to, supplying everybody who was on McKinley. So it was the first time I'd been in a small plane. And I was looking out the window at places that no man had ever walked, that hadn't been touched since the dinosaurs. I mean, I'd been in the back of jets, and it was kind of ho-hum. And this, the front window, that view was absolutely incredible. And I fell in love with that view. I, I didn't recognize that at the time. But I knew coming down off the mountain five days later that I really needed to have this bird's eye view again. And I said to Don Sheldon at that time, I, how hard is this to learn how to do? And he, go, he thank goodness, didn't say, um, you bubblehead model, you can't. He just said, uh, you have to really love it because it takes a lot of sacrifice and hard work and money to do it. And so that night, there was a welcome down party for us. And I said, I, I need a nighttime job in Alaska so I can learn, stay here and learn how to fly because it was the most beautiful place I'd been. And I ended up on Kodiak Island, Alaska, mm -hmm. um, working at the most popular bar in town, the one that the prostitutes worked out of. How was that? Uh, it was actually, um, the prostitutes were a lot of fun. We became yeah. friends. Uh, but it was, and, and it was an experience. It was my first nine to five job since I got out of college. Nine at night till five in the morning. I was gonna say. <laughs> I earned <laughs> every cent I made. And then I spent it all the next day at the airport. And so I learned how to fly in Kodiak. And, uh, but it was really depressing working in Alaskan bars too. I mean, there were people who, who came in when the place opened at 5 a.m. and you had to kind of roll them out on the sidewalk. Mm. It, was, it was depressing. So I ended up, um, uh, when I took my private pilot check ride, the, the FAA examiner, and, and here we are at the airport, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um, the FAA examiner said, when I took my private pilot check ride, the FAA examiner said it was the, one of the best, he'd been doing it for 30 years, he'd been an examiner for 30 years, and he said it was one of the best private check rides he'd ever given. And I had received a 100% on my private pilot written. Um, Were there any other women? No, no, I did not meet any other women pilots, there were none. I did not meet another woman pilot until I was an airline pilot. Honestly, I, I didn't. I had never heard of the 99s. I, um, so, I remember saying to the examiner, "That was the best ride you've given." I, you know, I mean, I was shocked because I felt like I didn't know anything because I had gone so fast. Mm -hmm. I was studying every night, flying every day, and so I was, I was learning quickly, but I had no nothing to gauge that by. So I felt like I didn't know anything yet. I mean, I knew enough to pass this check ride, but I didn't feel 
particularly knowledgeable. So I immediately signed up for more flight lessons. And since I had to have something to work toward, I worked for a commercial license. And then it seemed like a good idea to get an instrument rating. So the next thing I know, um, all in the first nine months after having taken that first flight. And how old were you then? 23, so still. 23. <laughs> I had my private commercial instrument instructor and ground instructor's licenses and still didn't feel like I knew anything. Wow. But I was, I was out of money in. Um, I went back to Alaska where the Alaskan pipeline was being built. Mm -hmm. There were nine men to every woman in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought maybe they'd run out of flight instructors and I might be a draw for all those guys. And um, sure enough, somebody hired me as a flight instructor. Okay. I had like 350 hours. <laughs> it was wow. positively frightening. I remember my first student getting in the airplane and I looked at him and I went, Oh no, he thinks I can save this plane. <laughs> and I don't know anything. I mean, really, that was my attitude. I just don't know all that much. And, um, so what happened um, was. So you became a commercial pilot. Um, when did you become a commercial pilot? Well, I, I was hired to flight instruct, which is my first commercial job, mm -hmm. uh, less than a year after I took my first flight. And while I was flight instructing that summer in Fairbanks, I, um, uh, the, the fixed-based operator also had the scheduled passenger and mail service up and down the Yukon River mm -hmm. and medical evacuation contracts for everything from the Yukon to Prudhoe Bay and the Arctic Ocean. So they were really, really busy. And um, one day when I was between students, they needed a, a pilot to fly some people out on a charter. And I was the only person there, so they sent me out. And I kept, against expectations, bringing back the aircraft undamaged. Um, and the people actually got where they were supposed to go. So my boss thought that, that was pretty good even though the boys at this time, and I'm calling them boys because really there's a lot of immaturity involved here. Um, <laughs> they were going, we do not want to work for a place that has a woman pilot. It was okay if I was a cute flight instructor, but you know, doing the same job as them, that was not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And the chief pilot there refused to give me check rides, which are required for somebody in the air ta doing air taxi work. So the, bot the owner of the company had to step in and do that because he was also qualified to do it. Um, by winter, I was on full time as a pilot flying the routes up and down the, the Yukon River, and the guys were in full po protest against me, saying well, it was. You were the only woman. I was the only woman. I was the only woman flying commercially in Alaska. They thought it was embarrassing to work for a company. They were pretty sure that I must be sleeping with the owner, the married owner of the company, mm -hmm. um, or else why would he have allowed this to happen? How did that make you feel? Horrible, it made me want to quit. It was very painful. But then I thought that if I quit, they would win. And um, it took me years to figure out that sometimes quitting is winning, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that, and it, it just, I loved it so much. Um, and then things finally came to a head. Uh, I'd been flying there for a couple of years when the, the pipeline companies said that all all of the aircraft flying onto the Alaskan pipeline had to have two pilots in each plane, and they both had to have ATPs um, because they'd had too many accidents, too many people dying. So they thought that was a safety factor. So all of a sudden, these planes that I had been flying, single pilot up and down the Yukon, I needed the co-pilot in to go on the pipeline, and the guys refused to fly co-pilot for me. Um, and around that time, one. So what happened? That was the cool part. <laughs> so the, the owner of the company, Paul Haglund, called me in and he said, I know it's not your fault, but I'm just so tired. You know, it's been two and a half years of dealing with this. And um, I'm going to have to let you go. Uh -huh. It just, like, it was as if the floor had opened. Um, so. I knew he was going to need more pilots, and I said, if I could find somebody who's totally qualified to 
who flies my co-pilot, would you hire him? You know, it never occurred to me to get a girl. Um, I yet had, you know, could, hadn't met them yet. So um, Paul said yes, and that very night, um, a man who, who had been my favorite instructor, Rex Gray, um, called and said he was just getting out of the military. He had been moonlighting as an instructor, and he, he said he wanted to get a job in Alaska, and could I help him get a job? And I said, would you mind flying as my co-pilot? And he goes, no, that would be fun. And so, next thing you know, I have this fabulous guy flying co-pilot for me, and we have such a wonderful time. Um, and Rex is one of those guys that everybody likes. Um, he kept coming back telling everybody how much fun it was to fly with Nora. Because every place we went, I was always invited to the parties. <laughs> so Rex got to go too. And he said, uh, he was telling the guys, and I get to fly every other leg and she never tells me how to fly. Well, he had a lot more time than me. And why would I tell him how to fly? I did teach him about routings in Alaska and some of the navigation. But we basically were having a fabulous time looking at each other going, oh wow, we're getting paid to do this. This is neat. And after a few months of Rex telling the guys how fabulous I was to fly with, the guys were saying to Paul, how come we don't get to fly with Nora? How come Rex gets to fly with Nora? So um, I got to stay on. It wasn't too long after that that um, I noticed that all of the men I worked with, especially the ones who tortured me most, were trying to be airline pilots. They all had applications in at different companies. And I loved the last guy that want to be an airline pilot. But, but um, one particular pilot who was more obnoxious than the rest really wanted to be a flying tiger pilot. And actually, all the guys had applied for Tigers because at the time, it was one of the best airlines in the world. It had the highest paid pilots. They only flew jumbo jets around the world. They had adventures. They had World War II aces, flying captain for it. It was a grand company. And um, so I noticed this one obnoxious person really wanted flying Tigers. And I had a few hours free in Prudhoe Bay where all the phone calls were free and called Flying Tigers in LA. No, I had never applied to the airlines. I had no idea what it took. And I asked to speak to the head personnel and they actually put me through. So I told him that I was a pilot thinking about being an airline pilot and wanted to know what was involved. And we talked for a while and he said, well, let me go get your application and I'll look at it. He said, but how did you know we were hiring? Because we just decided this morning that we were hiring after a three-year layoff. They just recalled their pilots and were going to hire. And I said, well, I haven't applied yet. I just was checking. But I'm coming down to visit my parents next week. Why don't I drop in and see you? And that's how I got my airline interview. And when I told the obnoxious one <laughs> that I had an interview with Flying Tigers, I thought he was going to steam up through the roof. He was so angry. So I had my interview with Flying Tigers with the head of personnel. He's, he um, put me in, uh, in line to be interviewed by four captains there, which was the next step in becoming an airline pilot. And I came back for that interview in the fall of 1976. and. Uh, I was surprised by the interview. I thought I was busy studying up FAA rules and things about jet engines, which I didn't know much about. Um, I thought they would ask me all these technical questions. But what happened is I walked in and they said, we understand that, I, I hope you know that we know that it's illegal for us to ask you anything we don't ask men, any questions that we don't ask men. And I said, no, I, di I didn't know that. Um, but I don't care. You can ask me whatever you want. Yeah. I have no idea what. <laughs> well, yeah, you're like, what's going to happen? Then? Well, they'd never interviewed a woman before. They told me that. So, uh, and it seemed reasonable mm -hmm. that they would ask. So, um, the first question they asked was, how are your periods? And I thought, hmm, and let me see, how do we encapsulate that data? <laughs> and, and one of the guys said, yes, we've noticed that you've taken three days of sick leave in the last three years. And were those because of your period? 
And I thought, wow, the math on that one isn't working out for me. <laughs> and, uh, and what I, I, I thought, well, you know, my periods, hmm, let me think about that. And he goes, can you tell me that your periods have never affected your flying? And I said, well, no, actually they have because I had had a recent experience where my chief pilot and I were both returning from Prudhoe Bay in an empty aircraft. We'd been flying all day. We're coming back to Fairbanks at night. I had cramps that were keeping me awake in my plane. He didn't have cramps, and he fell asleep at the controls. So I landed in Fairbanks, and he did not show up. And what happened was he overflew Fairbanks. And what saved his life was one of the engines running out of one of the tanks, running out of fuel, and his engine quit on the right side, which slewed him awake, right as the second engine was quitting. So here he had these mountains in his, his windscreen and no engine, so he quickly changed tanks and flew back to Fairbanks and told everybody, you know, I fell asleep. <laughs> um, because we told each other the truth so we could protect each other yes. from making the same mistakes. So I told Tigers, I said, so on long, boring freight runs, my cramps have kept me awake. And um, uh, they asked me that, I think the next question, and this may be what got me the job, other than the fact that I had thousands of hours in the Alaskan bush. They did say that they thought anybody with that many hours of no accidents was either very good or very lucky, and that they hoped I was both of those things. Um, but this next question, they said, so what are you going to do when a a flying tiger pilot makes a pass at you in the cockpit. And I was stunned, really, because all of our planes, we were open to the passengers, and half the time we didn't have autopilots, and who would have time for that? You know, really. <laughs> uh, so I said, would they have time? Would they do that? And they said, yes, it will happen, so what are you going to do? And I, here I am, I'm not unprepared for this line of questioning. I said, well, I guess I would just handle it like a normal pass. And they, they said, what is, what, do you, what is that? And I said, well, I would either say yes, please, or no, thank you. <laughs> and uh, they looked at each other and started laughing. Um, I think the fact that I was taller than three of them, that I seemed to have a reasonable idea of what I'd do if somebody made a pass at me, and that my cramps kept me awake on long, boring freight runs. I think those were the th reasons why I got to be an airline pilot. Because they, on they only asked me one aviation question, and it was toward the end. And it was about a plane I had flown in Alaska. They asked me how much fuel it held. It happened that they had all flown captain on that particular plane. And I couldn't remember how much fuel it held. And I thought I'd just flunked the interview. And I said, I'm so sorry, I, I just don't remember. So you guys flew captain on it. How much fuel does the C-46 hold? And they looked at each other and said, we don't remember. <laughs> so <laughs> evidently, that didn't disqualify them from being captains of 747s. So uh, I became Flying Tiger's first woman pilot December 1st, 1976. And at the time, uh, that was. I was in the first 10 women airline pilots hired in the United States. But as, ten. yes, I think the number varies on where I'm placed. It's from four to eight in the, in the lineup of in the first 10. But um, I was able with Flying Tigers to make some aviation first, not only being the first with them, but the first woman in the world to fly the DC-8, which is a four engine jet, and the first woman in the world to fly passengers on a 747. Also the first woman in the world to land in a number of different countries uh, as an airline pilot. Yes. So the media came out and made me feel like a two-headed chicken for a while there, too. Mm. So. Which, which countries did you land in? Oh, um, really all over Asia and all over the Middle East. They, they hadn't had women pilots coming through there. How did they treat you in the Middle East as a woman pilot? Um, not very well. I, it, the, uh, when I first went to Saudi Arabia, uh, they wouldn't talk to me on the radio. So their air traffic controllers wouldn't talk to me on the radio. I had to have the guys do the radio work so that we could get clearances. Um, 
the, I had a run in at the first hotel I stayed in, in in Saudi Arabia, not knowing, because when I went to the swimming pool in this hotel, there was a women's changing room and a men's changing room right at the swimming pool. The swimming pool at the time I went was empty. I was dressed very modestly, which I always do overseas. Um, but I started swimming laps in the pool, and within minutes, the manager of the hotel and two bouncers came out to tell me to get out of the pool. And I was young and stupid um, and sad. Why? <laughs> Rather than jumping out. And he said, because adult women are not allowed in swimming pools in Saudi Arabia. You know, you have to get out. And I went, well, that doesn't make any sense. And at that moment, he, he motioned to the bouncers to come and get me. So I got out of the pool. I didn't realize how precarious it had been for this manager that had I been seen in that swimming pool, the, you know, the hotel could have been blackballed, he could have been fired. I didn't know how serious it was. So uh, before I went back, I did, I did a lot more reading. Um, but I was escorted to my room and because uh, I asked too many questions on the way back, the manager suggested that I might want to stay in my room for the rest of the layover. And I did. <laughs> I think um, that throughout history, um, for various social and religious and practical reasons, women have been underutilized. And so we've had this whole part of humanity that where their intellect and their talents weren't used to the fullest. And um, I'm in, was in a generation of women where we were trying to do traditional and non-traditional things. We wanted to use the extra talents. It's something other than funneling it through our children and our husbands. I think if I had known what was coming, I might have turned away at the beginning because it was years of burying pain and sitting on anger because it wasn't useful in the early days to express that anger in the workplace. Um, because I was, I was the test, the guinea pig. Uh, just a, 10 years after my beginning, women were suing for what had been done to me. But us firsts, and I know because I know all of the firsts in the world, we did not feel that we could go in and protest or whine about what they were doing to us, that we had to take it and make it work and, and keep at it until they accepted us. So. That was, being um, a first was very, very difficult that way because it was um, counterintuitive to, to face kind of this abusive stuff and not do anything about it, you know. So we develop, developed different coping strategies, some of which were healthy and some which weren't. Mm -hmm. And then later on, in my case, I had to clean up some of my unhealthy coping habits. but. Um, I believe firmly, and, and this is with, with hindsight too, is that you, you absolutely have to go after your dreams or else you will never have a happy, fulfilled life. And it looks daunting, but if you stay in the moment, in the day, and go, I only have to do this today. I only have to take this lesson today, study this today, put up with this bad person today, then you can, you, if you don't quit, and cope day by day, and work really hard day by day, then your dreams can come true. They absolutely can. And I tell women now when I'm talking to women's groups, I suggest that you don't quit, but also that you take better care of yourself than I did. So how did it feel, you know, it, how did it feel to go after my dreams? It felt wildly exciting. I felt like I was the luckiest person in the world. The first time I flew a 747, I couldn't start, stop babbling about it for a day, you know. Um, the 747 ended up being my favorite aircraft. Even after all the years on it, I used to walk away from that plane and think, this moved that. 
And I know that this hand was connected to the hydraulics and everything else, but it was still magical. So I felt really excited about getting the opportunities. Um, I felt really excited that the women who came after me didn't have to, to put up with as much. I became kind of the mother hen to all the women who followed me at Flying Tigers. And then in 1978, two years after I was hired, the woman who was the first woman pilot hired at Continental ran into the first, the second woman pilot hired at American Airlines, and they decided that they would send letters to all the chief pilots of the airlines saying, if you have any women pilots, would you hand this invitation on? And we were invited to all get together in Las Vegas. Um, and that was 1978. And most of the first 21 women showed up in Las Vegas in 1978. And it was the first time I'd ever met other women pilots. Wow. And here were all the first of the U.S. and we all looked at each other. Really, it looked like a models convention. I think that, um, and I think that part of that was that the guys thought you had to be really tall, you know, a larger woman to be able to handle the controls, which is ridiculous, but that's what they thought. And um, I met these other women and it was during our talking together that I realized that what happened to me was happening to them. And, uh, and, and we started trading stories about how we coped, what worked, what didn't. That organization is now over 30 years old. We have given I, you know, close to a million dollars worth of scholarships to other women pilots coming up. What would you say, um, knowing what you know now, what would you have said to your 23, 24-year-old self? You are as good as they are. Don't listen to them. Do your best every single day, no matter what they say. Because I, my confidence was terribly eroded. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I think that um, luck is involved in having a successful career. And in my experience, the people who work hardest are the luckiest. So um, it's, it's really imperative, especially if you are a woman in a non-traditional, uh, going into a non-traditional profession, that you be the best you can be every single day. You make it your goal every day to be the best human being you could be that day. And, and that means compassionate, what are the things that bring you the most freedom and the most joy in your life? In my life now? Yeah. Or when did you find that? And then when? And then. When? Um, well, flying was probably the most abiding passion of my adult life. Love of flying. The only thing I loved more than flying was my children. Um, so it. It was, the payback was good. The payback, the marvels I saw from 747 windows, they, a comet going across the windshield of the Northern Lights. I mean, uh, just a spectacular life full of wonder and awe. I just love that part. It was very, very hard work. Uh, and it was punishing. Um, I can't say that my marriages failed because of my career, but that was part of it. Um, so. I am retired now, and I, I can no longer fly because of a medical condition. But what brings me joy now is um, I'm, I'm actually happier now than I've ever been, because everything um, is settled. I finally learned how, how to be happy, and it, it took getting away from conflict and stress for me to finally figure that out. I, I used to hear people say, you just get up in the morning and choose being happy. And I would think, well, that's ridiculous. If you had my husband or my job or blah, blah, blah. And the fact is, is you, you, that's the way you get happy. I wake up in the morning now and say, I'm going to be happy today. Whatever the day throws at me, I'm going to be happy with it. I'm going to treat everybody really well. 
I'm going to ignore the people who don't treat me well. And every day I set up something that brings me pleasure. So I, my life was full of theater and concerts and plays and art um, and all the art, the things I wanted to do with art that I didn't have time for. Now I, I get to paint, I get to write. Um, my life is very rich and full and it's full of women friends. So, I also attend Flying Tiger reunions once a year. Um, all, everybody who used to work for Tigers comes to those, and that's, that's wonderful. That's my family. F Federal Express bought Flying Tigers in 1989. So I retired as a Federal Express pilot, mm -hmm. and they're a very good company, but they're just not Tigers. I did, in... I, for, um, over many years, people would say, as I would come up with another story of being kicked out of the pool in Saudi Arabia, or um, things that happened to me in, in foreign cities, people would say, you need to write a book. And I, I always thought I, I always wanted to be a writer anyway. And in 1997, I had some personal issues that needed to be worked out. Uh, years of stuffing, years of stuffing pain and anger. Uh, finally imploded on me and I, I took a few years off and got my life in order and it was during that time that I wrote the book Flying Tigress and it was cathartic because I not only put down all of the bad things that happened and there were quite a few but I put down, I celebrated the fabulous things and really the fabulous far outweigh the bad and it, it's all a mix on this journey and the book ends happily so I'm I'm really glad that I was able to capture in that book this time period of what it was like for the firsts when the women first dared to cross the airline cockpit threshold because we did not tell the truth to the press at that time. It wasn't, wouldn't have been acceptable. And we can tell the truth now and honor ourselves for getting through it. Absolutely. So I'm that's... so glad that you did. <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for being here. This is such an honor. Well, thank you very much for asking me.